in the public consciousness, Leonardo da Vinci is most commonly associated with two of the most celebrated paintings in the Western tradition, The Last Supper and The Mona Lisa. These paintings are just two examples of the complexity and insight which shaped his work. Born in 1452, he was the consummate Renaissance man. Painter, sculptor, scientist, engineer and thinker, Leonardo's undoubted genius enabled him to evade the restrictions which a single discipline would impose. He was to achieve an almost legendary status in his own lifetime. I think he was a genius. He began to see how things could be made and could be made differently. He began to see the elements of things. He also had this intense interest in the way things work. He had a huge curiosity. Leonardo challenged all the prevailing scientific notions of his day, whether in anatomy, engineering, or architecture. He symbolized brilliantly the revival of true scientific inquiry. There is a very clear sense that in terms of using the visual medium that no one could begin to emulate the range of what he was doing. Freed from the constrictions of medieval culture, he was able to give free rein to his soaring imagination and insatiable curiosity. Leonardo's unprecedented intellectual gifts were to prove a formative influence on the future direction of both science and art. Leonardo was born in Vinci, a small town in Tuscany. He was the illegitimate son of Ser Piero da Vinci, a public notary, and a local peasant girl. Evidence of his exceptional intellect and diversity emerged at a very early age. He demonstrated a high degree of ability in the fields of mathematics, music, and art. One intriguing element in Leonardo's surviving notebooks is his chosen method of writing. Leonardo was left-handed, and he wrote backwards in mirror script. Left-handed, homosexual, vegetarian. These factors could have influenced uh, his creativity. It may have been that he was solitary and that sparked off a creative urge in him because being by himself, he would doodle and sketch and do all sorts of things like that. Of these various factors, the only one which is likely to have had much effect upon his career is his illegitimacy. Had he not been illegitimate, he would probably have followed his father's career of lawyer and we would never have heard of him in art or in science or engineering. Leonardo is a fascination as a person. If you do the Mona Lisa, then people are going to say, who did this? Or you did the Last Supper. So people latch on to these little biographical snippets. But if you read his notebooks, they are extraordinarily impersonal. He didn't put himself into the notebooks. Michelangelo, his contemporary, the great sculptor, wrote poetry, which was deeply revealing. And he wrote wonderfully personal letters. With Leonardo, he's aiming not to give that sort of insight. I think he's rather a private man. In 1466, Ser Piero da Vinci, aware that his son had a rare talent for drawing, took some of Leonardo's work to the leading Florentine painter and sculptor of the day, Andrea del Verrocchio. Verrocchio recognized the potential of the work 
and accepted the 14-year-old Leonardo as a pupil. To be apprenticed to Verrocchio was to be privileged. He was a man of vision who surrounded himself with some of the finest minds of the day. The years which Leonardo da Vinci spent in Florence were formative. He acquired a thorough knowledge of many disciplines. Anatomy, architecture, physics and engineering were among the subjects which absorbed him. However, it was in Verrocchio's workshops that Leonardo perfected his art. He experimented with colours, explored the laws of perspective and studied the subtleties of light and shade. As an apprentice, Leonardo assisted in the completion of commissioned paintings. In Verrocchio's The Baptism of Jesus, Leonardo painted a single figure, a kneeling angel. It was this figure which demonstrated the style which was to influence High Renaissance classicism. In 1481, Leonardo was invited by the Monastery of San Donato to paint an altarpiece, the Adoration of the Magi. Leonardo never completed it. His constant search for perfection, linked to a restless nature and a need for experimentation, meant that much of his work never reached fruition. There are various reasons why Leonardo didn't finish quite a lot of projects. Some are practical, you know, his patrons fell from power and there are all these vagaries which happen to any Renaissance artists. But there is this serious problem that if in looking at one thing you can always see its implications for something else, if you're writing on water and you can then see the implications of that for broader geological questions of the body of the earth, or you can see its implications for hair, or you can see its implications for music or sound, then you're in trouble, because you can't settle in a sense that no question is self-contained. It's a wonderful vision, but it's one which doesn't make for ready completion of a single project. In 1501, he was commissioned to paint a fresco celebrating a Florentine victory in the war with Pisa. This wall painting of the Battle of Anghiari was never completed. However, Leonardo made many preparatory drawings. Among them was a full-size cartoon which shows the horror of battle. Although the original cartoon was destroyed, there is a copy in existence made by the artist Rubens. Perhaps the most memorable aspect of his work is his ability to capture the subtle emotions which reveal the innermost processes of the mind. Leonardo used light and shade to create three-dimensional bodies and added atmosphere and depth to his work with subtle colour changes. The Last Supper reveals the psychological isolation of Judas. However, it is the mystery of the inner life captured by the enigmatic smile of the Mona Lisa which has generated more discussion than any other portrait in the history of art. The smile gives, above all, a sense of the motions of the mind. Portraits with no expression at all, which was rather the norm, clearly didn't give a sense of a mind turning over in the brain and actually working, but it may also be a pun. She was married to Francesco del Giocondo, and her nickname was La Gioconda, and that means the happy or smiling one. So I think it's possible that the smile could be an emblem. He did something very strange with the horizon. For, uh, perhaps I can demonstrate this with my hands. Uh, on one side of the picture, the horizon is here, and on the other side uh, of her head, the horizon is up there. So the viewer is continually oscillating, uh, particularly around the eyes, and that, me that creates the ambiguity. And the Mona Lisa out of its frame, particularly if the light changes slightly, kind of breathes against the background. It has this extraordinary quality of being alive. And I think the Mona Lisa probably comes as close as you could ever come to satisfying this total ambition that Leonardo has to get everything right in painting. For Leonardo, painting was just one form of artistic expression. 
In pursuit of an unprecedented realism within art, he constantly sought to increase his knowledge of the physical world. When Leonardo made a painting, any painting, he was aiming for it to do everything, to have the motions of the minds of the figures in the picture, as he called it, to have perfect veracity for every light effect, perfect veracity of space, and he set himself an impossible agenda, and he never quite realized the limitation of painting.